Um, hopefully that works a bit better. Is my audio working now? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, good. That's good to hear. Um, we seem a bit thin on the ground, but um, hello, everybody who's uh, actually turned up. Nice to see you all again. Um, there we go. Uh, <laughs> apparently we're all doing it at the same time um right yeah so let me uh, just get through um the agenda as we have it um right so we have a set of upcoming events um which you've probably all seen already at this point so um i'll just uh, recap very quickly um the european version of kubecon is due in may um i don't know where we stand with the uh, call for papers but i would imagine it's ended at this point um so we have the open source summit in june uh which almost certainly does have a call for papers i will go and do my research after this and uh add the uh add those deadlines in um the uh european open source summit in september and kubecon na in uh october um uh usual uh, um practice applies if you've got anything uh, at any of those events that you're putting in or that you would like to make people aware of once the schedules are announced then um, do tell us um, or add them yourself to the meeting minutes so that everybody knows what's coming up and what's worth doing oh we do have the call for papers a little there um right yes yeah, so um the um cloud native telco day there um at the kubecon eu so if you've got any papers to put in before february so that's about what four weeks left at this point um then uh we will check the pull requests and see what we have in the way of pull requests because i'm running the meeting and it's my pull request we'll open mine first um so the idea of this was basically um it's a how to do the paperwork side of things. Um, I wrote this up with the specific idea. I see we have no comments to speak of. I, I wrote this up with the specific idea of um, not saying here is the best practice, but here is how you document the best practices you are compliant or non-compliant with. Because the concept I had was that if you um, want to be compliant with all the best practices, there may be solid technical reasons why your CNF, your platform, your system can't be compliant for some way. Maybe uh, you have a better way of doing it or just simply a different way of doing it. Maybe it's something you haven't gotten to yet. Um, if you are, for instance, in my position, supplying a CNF to somebody, um, and they're giving consideration as to whether to run it. It may be acceptable that you aren't compliant with best practices, but it's important that you have a record of what you have and have not done so that they can review it and see what they've done. Um, so you can document, um, obviously, uh, a best practice that you are compliant with and any details of that compliance if it needs to be written down. But you can also document a best practice that for some reason you can't currently be compliant with um, and the consequences of uh, that lack of compliance. Um, so again, it, it's more in the nature of um, paperwork around documentation than it is about you will do things in, um, you will build your, um, your application or your system in a certain way. Um, I see it's got no reviews yet. Um, I encourage you to have a go at the reviews, um, skim it for yourself, make sure you get what I've um, written, what I was trying to get at. I've tried to keep it short. I wasn't trying to make anything um, particularly um, complex, just simply have a, um, a means of supplying that record um, so that everybody can review it on their own part as they're trying to build one of these CNFs or platforms or whatever into a system. Um, so, uh, any comments on that? Any thoughts? Okay, fine. We'll move on to what else we've got. Um, oh, damn it. 
Ian, this, this is Oliver. I, I generally understood what you were saying. I, I guess I wasn't really clear, though, uh, in terms of where where is it? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, I haven't read it. So <laughs> I, I guess I was trying to understand how it, how is this to be used, but um, maybe I, I will get that after reading it. So um, um, yeah, and, and honestly, it's lo so long since I've written it, I can't remember what I wrote. <laughs> so we're both having a problem here. I, I think the simple answer is to give it a read. Um, right. The conceptually, my point was that for an, a component in a system like a CNF or your Kubernetes platform or whatever, then if you, for whatever reason, can't be compliant with the rules, then um, it's better that you write it down and make that abundantly clear than you say, well, you obviously can't say we are compliant with the list of best practices. Um, so it's better that you document how well you've done and what you've missed um, so that when you try and, you know, if it's an open source project, when somebody tries to consume it, if it's a closed source product, then when somebody tries to buy it, they understand what they're getting into. Um, and similarly, at the system level, if you're um, at a telco and you're trying to build a system, then when your auditors come along and say, um, what from the best practices have you covered and not covered, then again, you're not trying to somehow scrape together a statement of compliance from components that simply don't comply. But instead, you're actually just putting it down on a piece of paper saying, this is how well or badly we've managed. Um, you know, the assumption here is that with the next version or um, whatever, you've got some updates and you would you would improve upon that compliance. And while you're not compliant, then you might have mitigations in place. So if you can't, for instance, make or use a CNF that's fully compliant with all of the security best practices, then you might put other security practices in place to manage that non-compliance. Um, you know, for instance, if you can't make it as impossible as necessary, as, as practical to break out of a container, you might put something in the platform to detect breakouts as an example. Okay, thanks for that. I'll have a, I'll definitely have a look. Yeah, uh, probably better read than me trying to review it for give you the clues from memory because again, I wrote this before <laughs> Christmas and it's been too long at this point, but uh, yeah. it's there to be looked at. Thanks. Right. Um, I actually haven't read this one either. So <laughs> I'm not going to do a very good job of this and it looks like nobody else has for that matter. Um, oh, I tell a lie. Uh, Olivier, yeah, that the, there's one or two reviews in there. Um, yeah, so the aim here was to um, uh, describe how um, user stories of stateful CNFs work, um, particularly um, things that have to live beyond the life of a piece of software. Um, you know, if the software is upgraded, rebooted, restarted, then the data that needs to live on beyond that point, um, that could be... Uh, simply configuration, it could be billing records, but um, the aim was to document best practices around that. So this is what you should be doing with that kind of data. This is the best way of storing it to get the level of resiliency that you're looking for. Um, uh, and again, um, I can't say that I've had a look through it. I see it's relatively brief, so uh, I should have a look through it. Um, again, anyone, any thoughts on this at this point in time? Okay, um, well, use your rules apply, it's there. Um, you should read it, you should put your review comments in there, I'm sure um, Taylor and Jeff would appreciate it because I think this is their baby. Um, right, this one, um, ooh, we do have two comments on this as well, and it's also incredibly brief. Um, the concept of this one is, um, it's pretty common in my experience, and I think that goes for Jeff as well, that if you're running a CNF or any network function in a telco network, then you generally don't hinge your um, ability to deliver services on an attachment to the internet. Um, so you're not necessarily pulling software directly down from the internet you aren't about to go to the internet to see if a corporate licensing server is going to give you a license today. 
Um, and of course, you don't really want to be connected to the internet, certainly on the management side of things, um, because security says that an air-gapped environment is, you know, infinitely more secure than one where potentially uh, an attacker can try to get control of your management network from the internet. Um, so this is best practices revolving around that level of disconnection. Um, if you're trying to put software into the network, how do you put software into the network? Uh, if you're trying to, you know, share uh, licenses with applications that require licenses before they'll come up, uh, how do you get those licenses um, to the relevant pieces of software when an internet connection is not feasible? Um, I don't know how far this has gone. Um, and again, I, um, I have a guilty conscience this week. Uh, I haven't looked at this one either, um, but I know that was the concept behind it. Um, I, I would guess by sort of simply reading the uh, high level description that this was effectively an attempt to get people to think on the subject. And uh, what it requires is not just comments, but actually extension, quite a bit more information than uh, it's currently contains. So um, uh, um, I imagine you all have an interest in this. Uh, it looks particularly like Victor already has shown an interest in this because I can see um, I can see the comments in there, um, but um, yeah, further review required. So uh, please do again, all have a look at this and see how, how you want to uh, improve upon it. Okay, and uh, that being the end of our very short agenda and only 20 minutes in the meeting, then um, you're now, um, we're up, up for open discussion. So has anyone got a point that they wanna bring? Wow, Frederick with nothing to say. That's got to be a first. Oh, he's not even responding to that comment. Okay. Um, heard, man. <laughs> hey, hello. Hey. Hey, Ian. Uh, good morning. Um, I had a pull request that I created, I think, a few minutes ago. Um, so that's basically to integrate some of the um, Kiverno test cases. Um, so I was trying to um, I was trying to integrate the Kiverno tool with the C, uh, CNF test suite. Uh, yeah. I created a pull request, but uh, do you not see that here? Uh, no, but if you if that's a pull request on the CNF test suite, then that will be in the CNF test suite repository. Oh, okay, this is the work group. Okay. Yes, um, and Lucina can keep me honest here, but I believe that group meets on Thursday mornings and that is probably a moment for raising it. Um, what I would say, and I think we've had this discussion before, is if uh, Kivano can be a solution for best practices, if you can take what you're trying to do with Kivano and speak about it in the abstract rather than using the tool name, then that's what I would call the best practice. So you're not describing uh run this kaverno command run this you know run this in your um in your ci or whatever what you're doing instead is you're saying that this is a problem with this system and um you want mitigations of this nature in place um i think we did have one a while back which basically did describe um some of the ways in which you can apply security um, such as effectively active monitoring of a system that's running to make sure that, you know, security red flags are picked up early. Um, but anything that you consider to be uh, worthwhile in any form, including, you know, static analysis or um, test analysis of, an, of something you might want to be running in CI or alternatively monitoring it in production. If you can bring that into the abstract and say this kind of monitoring should be seen in, the, in a running system because it's an obvious thing to do and without it, then you're at serious risk, then that's the level of description that we're looking for here. Okay. Um, got it. Uh, so basically, um, so you want like an abstract of what, what, what problem that uh, particular policy or tool is trying to uh, bring, right? That's what you want, correct? Yeah, so you're making effectively your case for Kiverno in the abstract. You're saying that 
um, and, and there's nothing wrong with being very pointed about your use case, but you're saying in the abstract here is a problem and in the abstract here is a way of making sure that problem doesn't cause you significant distress. And then um, from there, you would say Kiverno is a solution to that problem. And for these reasons, this is a thing that it does and this is how it helps you. Hmm. Okay, okay, got it. Um, yeah, Another sure. way of looking at this is we don't, I, I mean, I have no problems with recommending specific tools, but I, this should not be, you know, if somebody creates another tool in the future, which is tons better for whatever reason, it shouldn't be ruled out because we picked a tool by name. But um, aside from that, I mean, the, the point of why you would want to do this should always be, you know, true. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll work on the abstract and yeah, I'll send it over so we can. Great. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Right. And I see um, uh, Lucina's got a comment on that pull request for you. So, uh, and, and pointed you at the relevant Slack, which I apparently. Okay. Could, yeah. Sure. I so think I should have access. Grab that link before the meeting ends out the chat. That will, that will help you along. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Ian. Um, anybody else? Um, uh, or alternatively, would you like your day to end early? Would you like your morning to start early? Okay, well, if that's the way we're going this morning, then I think we'll, uh, I'll give you your time back and uh, you can go and uh, um, start writing pull requests for me. Thank you everybody for your time. I'll see you again next week. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Bye.
Thank you.